Church, thank you for joining us this morning. Stand up if you're able, in your living rooms, wherever you are. Sit on your couch comfortably in your bed. And uh, let's worship God together. Sing what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. trouble anywhere Jesus Savior is our refuge take it to the Lord in prayer are we weak and heavy laden cumbered with the load of care Jesus knows our every
this morning is Isaiah 55 verses 1 through 7 come everyone who thirsts come to the waters and he who has no money come buy and eat come buy wine and milk without money and without price why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast love, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. This morning, we also want to have a time of prayer. We want to give you an opportunity to pray together as a family. So we're going to pause the service for just a few moments. And we're going to allow you to gather together with your family, whoever is there with you. And we're going to ask you to spend just a few moments in prayer together as husband and wife or as family members who are watching the service together. Thank God today for the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ and for the ability that we have to worship Him. Let's pray this morning.
Father, today we come to you as a unified body. Although we are spread out across South Florida, we lift our hands together in unified prayer, thanking you for Jesus this morning, thanking you for the pardon, for the forgiveness that is available through him alone. And we worship him this morning. Lord, I pray that you would help us first and foremost to sense your presence. You promised us that where just two or three are gathered together, you're in the midst of them. So, Lord, I pray that you would make yourself known, manifest yourself to your body as it is scattered across Broward County and Hollywood. Help us to sense your presence. Minister to us. I pray that you would encourage us. I pray that you would edify us. Lord, I pray that you would increase our faith this morning. We submit ourselves to you individually and corporately as a church. We submit ourselves to you afresh and anew. God, do a work of grace in our hearts this morning. And we promise to give you all the praise and honor and glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.
Welcome to Hollywood Community Church's online service this morning. We are so honored that you and your family have chosen to worship with us today. If this is your first time watching online, we want to thank you so much for watching with us. And so during the service, we would ask you and even our faithful uh, attenders, if you would just smash that like button on Facebook or even on YouTube so that we know you're here and we know that you are enjoying the service. Especially if it's your first time here, we really desire to keep in touch with you. And so on our webpage, www.ourhcc.org, there's a connection card. You can also find that connection card on our app. And we would encourage you to fill that out and to send that in so that we have a record of your attendance with us today. If you're watching from out of state or maybe you're watching from out of the country, would you be kind enough just to put on the Facebook page or on the YouTube page where you are and from where you're watching the service so so we can rejoice with you that our our broadcast is reaching that far out. During this time, we really want to be a blessing to families, and we want to help support families. And so along those lines, each week we will be posting lessons, Bible lessons, on our website so parents, you can take your children through those lessons. There's a password on the screen right now that will give you access to that material. Chase, our next gen director, will also be posting teaching videos for the youth on their Instagram page, so we would encourage them to go there. Lastly, we want to offer you all of the free resources that we have at Right Now Media. And as a member of Hollywood Community Church, you have access to videos and cartoons and teachings all geared towards families. And we would encourage you to take advantage of that. So again, thank you so much for making Hollywood Community Church a part of your weekend experience. And our prayer is that you will greatly enjoy the service this morning. So today we want to encourage you to give. And there's various ways that you can do that. And we're going to be putting a graphic up on the screen during this time in which we are actively involved in almost all the ministries that we're normally involved in. We're going to ask you to be faithful in your giving. And so this is a great time. If you have not transitioned to online giving, we would encourage you to do so. You can go to our website and you can give online or you can go to our app and through PushPay you can give there as well. But we would encourage you as a member of HCC to help us, to partner with us and to be faithful in your giving. If you would like to, you still can mail your check to Hollywood Community Church, but you join with us, partner with us together as we make a difference during this difficult time, not only here locally, but also around the world. God bless you as you give to the work of God this morning. So church, this is a new song for us. It's called As It Is In Heaven. Uh, written by the local group Village Hymns and um, I think it's just such a beautiful song Uh, just soaked in scripture the gospel truth truth of God's word and um, just encourage you to worship as we sing this one Gracious measure, hallowed is your name on high. Come, thou fount of favor, haste your hand of mercy over us. As it is in Is 
Good morning, church. Thank you for joining us online. This morning, we are beginning a new five-part series called Who is Jesus? We are going to unpack the answer to that question over the next several weeks, and we hope that this series will be a blessing to you and your family. In this moment, all of us are living through a very difficult time, and for many of us, the coronavirus has impacted our country, our world, in a way we never imagined, and our lives are interrupted completely and utterly, it has been a complete disruption to our everyday normal way of living. And the coronavirus has exposed every one of us. And you might say, Brad, how has the coronavirus exposed us? And that's a great question. You see, for many of us, our lives before the coronavirus was normal. We had opportunities to go to work. Our kids were in school. We could go out to eat to whatever restaurant we wanted to go to. We could hang out in social places together and have fun with friends and family. We could go to kids' sports games or their performing arts activities and events and have a great time with that. We could also go to church and be around one another, or we could just hang out with friends, attend birthday parties, do whatever we wanted, and you could make a list of your own of all the things you used to do. And all of these things gave us a sense of comfort, of peace, of security, pleasure, joy, and satisfaction. However, in one quick moment, 
all of those things have been interrupted, every single one of them. In one moment, we can no longer engage in those things that once provided comfort, security, and peace of mind. This virus has exposed a weakness in each of us. And as we quarantine ourselves and as we social distance ourselves, we've had to wrestle with what does life mean now? What are we supposed to do? What is, what's the meaning of life when we can't do the normal things that we've had to do before? Our comfort is gone. Our security is gone. And for many, the joy has been sucked out of our lives. And we sit back and many become angry. Many become frustrated, depressed, anxious, worried, whatever. You name it. People are frustrated and having a difficult time with the coronavirus. It's exposed a weakness. And what is the weakness that has been exposed in us? You see, for far too long, for many of us, we found our purpose, our security, in the things of the physical realm instead of the spiritual realm. In other words, we have set our eyes on earthly things instead of heavenly things. And I'm not saying there's anything inherently wrong with careers and, and hobbies and sports activities. There's nothing wrong with those. But the problem we had is when those physical things became where we focused on and became our source of joy, became our source of pleasure instead of the spiritual realm where God is. And for many of us as believers, we've had to wrestle with this and we've had to sit back and realize, man, it is not about the physical realm that matters. It is all about the spiritual realm. And when everything is stripped away, the spiritual is what remains and the spiritual is more than enough. And so all of us have been exposed, but Jesus has come to expose us to God's grace. And this morning, we're going to unpack this simple truth. And I I wrote it in my notes this way. I put, real life is found in the Messiah. Real life is found in the Messiah. So turn with me, if you have your Bible, if you have your Bible app, turn to John chapter 4. It'll also be on the screen for you as well. John chapter 4 tells the story of Jesus' encounter with a woman at the well. This story is messy, it's scandalous, yet it's a beautiful story of God's love and God's grace. And it is a story that is absolutely fitting to today. So let's dive in. John chapter 4, verse 4 through 9 says this, And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And I love what John says in verse 4. He says, Jesus had to go to Samaria. I love that the author John adds that detail to the story because what this means is Jesus had a divine appointment with this woman at the well. He came to this specific well to see this specific woman. It was part of his mission to meet this woman, to meet her where she was because he had a purpose that he wanted to unfold in her life and for our life. And I love that we have a God who is like that. This is a beautiful truth, church, that we have a God who created the whole entire universe and put us, humankind, as his prized possession in his world that he created for us to enjoy and reflecting praise and glory back to him and loving him and telling the world about him. And He didn't, when we messed up and when we sinned and sin came into the world, he didn't start everything and leave us behind and is somewhere off in the distance having nothing to do with us. We have a God that actively pursues us, that actively chases us, that actively loves us. And I like to look at it this way. I heard one scholar describe it this way. Imagine that God wrote a play and God is the author of this play. He has the characters in place, but he's not just the author of the place. Imagine if the author of a play then invaded the play and became the leading role of that play. And this is exactly what God has done 
with us, with our story here in the world. He has invaded our play and has become the leading role in the play. And John chapter one tells us that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then he became, the word became flesh. And he became flesh through Jesus. God became man in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is pursuing this woman on purpose because he wants to show her what God's love looks like and what God's grace looks like. So when she sees Jesus, she sees the Father. And when she sees Jesus' love, she sees the Father's love. And Jesus pursues us in the same way, church. He shows himself to us. He reveals himself to us through Jesus Christ. And this flows from the grace of God. And we all have to wrestle with the question of then how do we respond to the grace and the revealing that God has shown us through Jesus Christ? John mentions that Jesus is tired and sits down at the well and waits for the woman to show up. And he mentions that Jesus was tired to show that God, that Jesus, yes, he was fully God, but he was also fully man. And he was enduring the limitations of being a man. He was tired and he was thirsty. And so he sits down at the well and he waits for the the Samaritan to come. And this is where the story gets scandalous because Jesus is about to talk to a Samaritan and not just any Samaritan. He's going to talk to a Samaritan woman and not just any Samaritan woman. She is a woman with a messy, sinful life, which we'll learn more about in just a moment. And so, so why is this scandalous? Well, we have to remember that there was bitter hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. You see, the Samaritans descended from a rebellious tribe of Israel who broke away from the kingdom of Israel. And they started their, their, their own land, and they began to live there. And then the Assyrians came into their land, and then they intermarried with one another. And so they became a intermixed tribe. And not only that, but the Samaritans only held to the first five books of the Old Testament called the Pentateuch. And they said that was all the scripture there is. That's all the scripture that's valid. And everything else, they didn't want to have anything to do with it. And not only that, but they said, you know what? The true worship of God is going to happen at the temple that is on Mount Gerizim. Whereas Israel said, no, the true temple of God is found in, in Jerusalem. And so there is, these, there is theological differences between the Samaritans and the Jews. And because of that, they hated each other. And not only that, but then Israel at some point in time went and burned down the temple, the Samaritans temple at Mount Gerizim. So that creates even more bitterness and hatred towards one another. And not only was she just a Samaritan, but she was a Samaritan woman. And during this time in the ancient Near East, Jewish men were discouraged from talking with women, especially rabbis and teachers. They were discouraged because of the possible shaming and rumors and gossips. And even single men were told, don't talk to a woman because rumors could start that maybe some sexual immorality had come up. And there were even some prayers that, some daily prayers that included this line, among other things, thank you, Lord, for not making me a woman. And so there was this idea that If you were a man, you didn't have these kind of conversations with a woman. Yet here is Jesus, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, sitting at a well, talking to a Samaritan woman, and not just any woman. He was talking to a Samaritan woman whose life was a mess and living in sin. You see, John adds a detail that she showed up about the sixth hour, which is considered around 12 o'clock p.m., which is a hot part of the day. And so we, we see that when she comes here, most of the time when the women would come and draw water, they would do it in the cool of the day, whether it was early morning or late afternoon. And it would provide an opportunity for the women to fellowship, to socialize, to, to talk about, hey, my husband's doing this, and how are you doing? What's up with the kids? And eh, all that kind of stuff. And here, she doesn't choose to do that. And the reason why is because this woman has a bad reputation. And so you know how normal people are if you're living in sin. Sometimes you have people that talk gossip. Sometimes there's rumors that go around. Sometimes people judge you and make you feel less of a person. So to avoid all of that, she goes to the well at noon so she wouldn't have to hear those whispers and those, the gossip. And not only that, there's an author named Marsh. And I want to kind of to wrap up this scandalous part this way because he says, he describes the situation this way about the woman. She is a representative of her people at their best. I'll read that again. He says that she is a representative of her people at their best. This author is saying that the hatred towards the Samaritan was so strong that this Samaritan woman represents the best of the Samaritans even though her life is full of sin. So scandalous conversation Jesus is is having, 
but he's about to expose us to God's grace. In spite of all this, Jesus asks her for a drink. And she is shocked by that. And she's like, why are you a Jew asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? And Jesus was really willing to drink from the Samaritan woman's cup, her utensil. So if anybody had been a hot mess down, it was this woman. But in reality, church, her story is our story. Before Christ, all of us had a life that was filled with sin and mistakes, and it was messy, and it was ugly, and there were things that people could say about each and every single one of us. Her story is our story, yet we see that even though our lives were full of sin and idolatry, Jesus loves us, Jesus pursues us, and he exposes to us our weakness so he can expose to us his grace. Let's continue the story. Verse 10 through 15 says this. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus mentions to the Samaritan woman that he would give her living water. What does he mean by living water? In the ancient Near East, living water literally referred to running water, which is talking about water that was in a river or a stream, a water that flowed where the fresh water would constantly flow through and kick out the bad, kick out the bacteria and keep the water fresh. And this living water would be fresh and clean rather than being a stale, stagnant, nasty, algae, bacteria-filled pot. If you ever took a pot of water and left it out outside your house and let it sit there for weeks on end, there's going to be bugs that move in. It's going to get nasty and nasty nappy and you don't want anything to do with that water. And here Jesus is saying, I'm offering you living water that will be fresh, that will be clean, that will be different than what you've ever experienced. But Jesus's water is different than the physical water that the Samaritan woman thinks Jesus is talking about. She's focused on the physical water and Jesus is trying to show her that this living water is in the spiritual realm, not the physical And this living water is part of God's new creation in the world. And this living water would bring life to anyone who drinks from it. And I love in these verses that Jesus says that this living water is a gift of God. That means it can't be earned. That means that we can't, we don't, it's not about how we work hard enough for it. It's not about how many good deeds that I do. It's none, none of that. We don't have to pay for it, work for it, or earn it. It's from God's grace alone. And this water is available to anyone, no matter who you are, where you're from, or what you've done. No matter your gender, your geography, political, social, or racial background, it is a gift that is available to anyone. But yet the Samaritan woman still doesn't grasp that Jesus is speaking about the spiritual realm and not the physical. She points out to him, well, look, you don't even have anything to draw water with. How can you offer me water Where are you getting this water from? And then she asked him a question. Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well. And this is the second reference to Jacob in this chapter. And it's the fourth time so far in the book of John up to this point. And so why is John making this detail about Jacob? Why is is he pointing it out to us? What is significant about that? Well, he wants us to see that Jesus is the new Jacob the the new Israel, the true Israel. And he is ushering in the people of God in a new way. It is not based upon your ethnicity. It's not based upon your traditions. It is solely on faith in him as the Messiah. And it doesn't rely on the faith and traditions of those who came before you, that Jesus is the new way to the Father. But not only that, he's showing us that Jesus is the bridegroom. If you remember the story of Jacob, Jacob met his wife, Rachel, at a well, and here Jesus is meeting this Samaritan woman at a well. 
Jesus came for his bride, and in the scriptures you see God is referred to as the bridegroom, and Israel is his bride. And so here Jesus is coming. His mission is to come to purchase, to redeem, and to set free his bride so he can love his bride for all of eternity. And we see this story of God's playing out with this woman at the well. So Jesus tells her that whoever drinks of this living water will receive eternal life. And eternal life, so many times, we think it's just going to heaven and sitting on a cloud, sitting in a diaper and playing a heart. But that's not what eternal life is all about. Eternal life is we are becoming a new creation. We're created with the restored vocation to love God, to serve him. And it's also we are going to serve in God's world right now until he returns, telling as many people about the good news as possible. And then when Jesus returns and creates a new heaven and a new earth, We will reign over his creation, ruling over his new heaven and his new earth, reflecting praise and glory back to him. So eternal life, so many times people think it's just about heaven, but it's more than that. The hope is the resurrection of our our bodies where we get glorified bodies so we can live in this new creation that God has in store for us. And so to receive the living water is to receive this eternal life and this hope that is to come. And then she says in verse 15, she says, give me this water so I won't be thirsty and have to come here again. She's still focused on the physical. She hasn't noticed that Jesus is talking about the heavenly things. She's on the earthly things and thinks, if I could just drink this water, I'll never be thirsty. I don't ever have to take a sip of water. And I don't have to come here and drag this pot of water over here, get all this water into this jar and walk it all the way back. My life would be easier. And she's so concerned and focused on the earthly things. And right now, for many of us, we could sit back and we can say the same thing about our lives during this epidemic and crisis, is we can become so concerned about the things we don't have on earth or the things we wish were different on this physical earth that we miss out on seeing what God is doing in the heavenly world and the heavenly realm and the heavenly things. John 4, 16 through 18. We're going to read in just a moment, but Jesus is about to wake her up to reality. He's about to open her mind to see what he's really and truly talking about. Verse 16 says this, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one now you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Jesus brings up her past. He brings up her mess. He brings up her sin. She's had five husbands and the one she's with now is not her husband. And we don't know what happened in those past relationships, but clearly this is an area of weakness of hers, an area of sin that she is in. And why does Jesus bring up her past? Well, if you remember what we just said before, she asked Jesus to drink that living water. And Jesus wants her to understand that if you drink the living water, you will never stay the same. That if you drink this water, you will have to change. Something has to be done with the sin in your life. It can't stay there. This living water that's like a spring that bubbles up and springs to life, it is going to flush out the bad that is in your heart and in your mind, the idols, the idolatry, the sin, the brokenness, the mess, that when the living water comes, it is changing you. And if you drink this water, you will never be the the same. That stagnant water, it has to go. And he's telling her, your sin has to be dealt with. And so I want to kind of give you an illustration because um, I have a picture that I'm going to show you right now. And this picture, it shows a pool, but it shows the same pool, but in two different conditions. The one pool on the left is green. The other one is blue. The one on the green is the stagnant water that Jesus is saying has to get out. And this stagnant water happens because bacteria is allowed to grow. The pool is not running properly. It's not being taken care of. And this pool will stay green and it will get worse over time. It can become black with algae on the top and completely gross, nasty. It can become a cesspool. It can get really disgusting left in that condition. What Jesus is telling this, is telling this woman is telling us is that this is our heart condition before Christ. It's messy, it's stagnant, it's stale, it's a mess, it's sinful, and it offends a holy and just God. But the beauty of God's grace is when he exposes our sin to us, 
he exposes his grace to us and says, man, if you drink of the living water, then his living water will usher in. And to get that pool color on the right, outside sources have to enter that pool. The pump has to come working as the fresh water pumps through that pool and goes through the filter system. And as the chemicals go in, it will turn that pool blue like you see on the right. In the same way, when you receive and you drink of Jesus' living water, his grace will flood your heart, will f- flush out that sin that is in your heart, that's in your life. Those idols can be broken, and he will make you clean. And this is what Jesus is telling this woman at the well. In order to drink the living water, there has to be forgiveness of sins. And it can only come through God's grace. And it can only come through what he is about to reveal to this woman. And so our sin gets exposed to his grace. And then we receive his love and forgiveness. Look at verses 19 through 24. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You will worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship and spirit and truth. The Samaritan woman does what most of us do when our sin is pointed out. She deflects. All right, time to change the subject. Jesus, you're touching a sore spot. I really don't want you to go there. I'm just going to kind of change your topic. I'm going to make it about, let's make it about religion. Let's just make the topic about religion. And come on, Jesus, isn't there just a bunch of misunderstandings? Couldn't you be wrong? Couldn't we be right? Let's just not focus on my sin. And so she tries to turn this conversation there, but Jesus doesn't let her, her do that. He tells us, look, it's not about what I'm doing in the world now. It's not a, in the future, very soon, when his work is completed, it doesn't matter where you worship God and it doesn't matter where you are from. And he rightly points out to her, look, your faith, the Samaritan's view of faith, it's wrong. Salvation to the world, it does come from the Jews and it's not the Jews himself. It's through the Messiah. And so salvation is from him. And he's trying to tell her, look, soon and very soon, Whoever, wherever you are, you can worship the God who is spirit, who's in the spiritual realm. And the kind of worship God desires is one where there is a spiritual focus, not an earthly focus. And so he points out to her, man, look, that objection needs to sit to the side. We have to get to the heart of the matter. We have to focus on the spiritual realm, not the physical realm. And so Jesus is telling us, Our traditions are not good enough to get us faith. He doesn't let her objection stay and he lovingly pursues her while lovingly pursuing us as well. So then the woman, she she hears his objection to her objection and she says this, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming and he who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you, I am. She tries to deflect one more time by saying, you know what, when the Messiah comes, he can clearly explain all of it to us and then I will be willing to make a decision. And this is also a way that many of us have dealt with wrestling with God and whether or not to put our trust and faith in him is one day when the time is right, I will make that decision. But Jesus stops her and says, look, here's the reality. You're looking for the Messiah and guess what? I who speak to you, I am. I am the Messiah. I am God. I'm the Father in flesh. When you see me, you see the Father. And Jesus reveals himself to her in that moment. And he rocks her world with that statement. The one in whom all the promises were given in the Old Testament, this is him in the flesh, standing before her, revealing himself to her, saying, yes, I know you got sin. Yes, I know your life is messed up, but I am here to love you and give you my grace if you believe that I am the Messiah, the hope of the world. And then we see that she was so overwhelmed at this revealing of Jesus as the Messiah that she ran away back to her village without taking the jar of water 
that she came all the way out there for. She runs back to her village, tells them, you have to meet this man who just interrupted everything in my life and her life will never be the same. Look at verses 29 through 30. It says this, the woman says, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and were coming to him. She ran, shared her story of the Messiah. He, her testimony is, look, he told me everything wrong that I have ever did. And here Jesus still offered her living water, still offered her eternal life. And she tells all of them, wait, this could be the Messiah. You have to go meet him. And so her testimony brought many to meet Jesus. And I love the way John tells the story of them. It says this in verse 39 through 42. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. Catch this. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. I love that last verse. It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. Two things. First is this, we cannot rely on the faith of someone else. You can't rely on your parents' faith. You can't rely on your coworkers' faith. You can't rely on your auntie's faith. You can't rely on the faith of a pastor at your church. When it comes to Jesus and your faith and your salvation, it has to be a personal faith of yours, your personal faith in Jesus Christ. It cannot rest on the faith and testimony. At some point, you have to answer the question, who is Jesus? And my encouragement would be to you is when Jesus speaks these words, I who speak to you am he, I am the Messiah, that you would declare in your heart, your mind to God saying, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. It is a personal faith that you have to have in Jesus Christ, not on anybody else's testimony. And then they point out that Jesus is the savior of the world. And this shows us God's intention from the beginning. He became the true Israel. He has become a light to the nations. And he is not just the God of Israel. His salvation is for all people. And this is why in John chapter 3, 16, while Jesus is talking to the wise uh, Jewish leader, uh, religious leader, Nicodemus, he tells them, for God so loved the world, right, that whoever believes in him will have everlasting life. And I think this is why John puts these two stories back to back. You have a religious leader who needed to be told, look, your view of the Messiah and the way that you had it, you're missing it. It's not about your traditions. It's not about law. It's about grace. And he tells Nicodemus and Nicodemus doesn't understand it. He doesn't get it. But then Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman who has the false theology. And he tells her, this is who the Messiah is. I'm the Messiah. And then she gets it. And what's, what's happening here? Jesus is a light to the nations, to the Jew first and also the Greek. He has come for the entire world to be savior of the world because he is king of kings and Lord of lords. So I summed it up this way. Jesus meets an outcast woman full of sin and full of mess. She tries to hide her sin, but Jesus lovingly pursues her and reveals himself to her and her life is changed forever. She went from outcast to child of God in one quick moment. And this is the result of the good news at work in the hearts of people. You see, Jesus came to set each of us free from our idols and give us forgiveness of sins, to restore our vocation and give us eternal life. And it all begins with admitting that Jesus is the Messiah. Yes, your sin will be exposed, but understand you will then be exposed to God's grace and God's love. Then you will see real life is not found in the physical realm and the things of the earth. Real life is found in 
the Messiah. So no matter what happens in your life, if the physical is stripped away right now during the quarantine, we have real life because we have real joy and real love and real peace because we have real life in the Messiah. And that's what life is about. It's about setting our sights on things above, not things below. And when we say things above, it's, it's the idea of we're looking at the spiritual realm, not the physical. We're looking towards Christ, towards our Father in heaven, and that's our source of strength. That's our hope, and that's where we set our eyes. And so I'll close with, with two encouragements. For those of you that are watching and have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you now have to answer the question. Jesus has revealed himself to you through his word, saying he is the Messiah. And how will you respond to that? I would encourage you to place your faith in Jesus today. And you might say, Brad, how do I do that? Well, it's in your heart, in your mind, declaring Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus, forgive me, have mercy on me. And if you make that declaration, the Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that spring of living water that Jesus talks about will flood your soul, will change your heart, will take away the sin, will take away the brokenness, and will cleanse you, and you will receive forgiveness of sins, and all your sins have been taken care of on the cross through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. For those of us who are believers, we're living in a world now where people are walking around disillusioned, depressed, anxious, worried, and afraid. And we have an amazing opportunity to share the good news now more than ever before. And I'm not gonna read the verses, you can go back and look at them later, but John chapter four, 34 through 38, I recommend you go read it. Jesus talks to his disciples and tells them that the harvest field is ready, that God has done the work of sowing the seed, he's done the hard labor, and now he's telling his disciples, look, the hard part's done, but the time is now that we go out and reap the harvest that God has labored for. That as we bring the good news out, we will see a harvest because God has been working and tilling the fields and sowing the seeds. And now is the time to go out and tell people that Jesus is the Messiah. In our world today, now is the time to let these people who are desperate, their idols have been taken away and they don't have comfort. They don't have peace because they can't engage in their idols and they're looking for something to hold on to. And we as a church have the opportunity to say, what you need to hold on to is Jesus. Don't hold on to the earthly things. Hold on to Jesus. He is King. He is Lord. And in him is forgiveness of sins. And so our time is now, and it starts with your neighbors, starts with people you can connect through through the internet. We're all social distancing. We're all having to use technology. And churches are online like never before, and the gospel is going forth. So now is our time to see what God will do during this season of difficulty because we know that nothing can stop God's love, that nothing can stop his will and his plan in this earth. And we know on the other side of this epidemic, there is going to be rejoicing and celebrating because God is going to change lives and save souls. And we have an opportunity to be a part of that. Would you pray with me today? Father in heaven, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, into this world. Father, we thank you that you looked down and saw our sin and saw our brokenness and the mess of a life that we made for ourselves. And Father, you didn't look at us with hate. You looked at us with sorrow and love and didn't want us to stay there. And Father, you made a way for us to return to a relationship with you. You found a way for us to be put right again, Father God. You found a way to break our idols and to give us forgiveness of sins so that we could once again be your children and you would be our God and you would love us as a bridegroom loves his bride. And Father, we thank you for that. And Father, we thank you that you have exposed our sin so you could expose us to your grace. And Father God, I pray that we would walk in your truth, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth, so you would get the glory and you would get the honor forevermore. We love you. It's in your beautiful and precious and majestic name we pray. Amen. I've been held by the Savior. I felt fire from above. I've been down to
HCC family, let me share some announcements with you today as we conclude our service. This Wednesday at 7 p.m., we will have a Passover Seder online. Maybe you've never experienced a Passover Seder before, and we would encourage you to get online and join in with us. Stephen Cawthon, one of our ministry friends, will be leading this Passover Seder. And once again, you can get on our Facebook Live page or on our YouTube channel, and you can participate with us this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. Friday is Good Friday, and we will have two services online. We'll have a service at noon, and then we will also have a service at 7 o'clock online, and we would invite you to join in with us once again, either on Facebook Live, our YouTube channel, or on our website. Our Good Friday service will be unique, um, along with worship and a brief message. We're going to take the Lord's Supper, and we would encourage you to participate with us from your homes. And so you can prepare ahead of time by purchasing grape juice and just uh, bread and having that ready to take the Lord's Supper, 
or for your convenience, we are preparing bags that are going to have in them invitations to our Easter services, as well as pre-packaged Lord's Supper supplies. And so beginning Monday, uh, we're going to have a table outside of our main entrance with bags, and each of those bags are going to have about 10 to 15 Easter invitations that you can put in the mailboxes of your neighbors or friends, along with those pre-packaged Lord's Supper supplies. So we would encourage you to come by. It's going to be safe. No one's going to be out there. You're not going to have to interact with anyone. We would just encourage you to come by and pick up a bag or two, enough for your family to take the Lord's Supper with us. We also then would encourage you to join us on Easter Sunday at 10 a.m. as we gather together at the same time for a Resurrection Sunday service online. This is unique for all of us. We've never done this before. But I would encourage you at 10 o'clock once again to gather around your computer or your television and let's celebrate the fact that our Lord is risen and we will celebrate that together. And by the way, we will have digital invitations that you can send out. We will have those ready and Lord willing, we'll send those out later in the week. Finally, if you would like one of our pastors or one of our elders to speak or pray with you, please send an email to us. We'd love to hear from you. Just send a small email to hccadmin at ourhcc.org and include your name and your phone number. And one of our pastors will gladly reach out to you. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. God bless you. Have a great week.